So hello everyone and welcome to the FIP Langlois seminar series. My name is Celeste DiGiovanni and I will be your facilitator today. We're delighted that you have chosen to spend your afternoon with us here. Today I'm honored to present Emmanuel Defret, who works as a research scientist with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. His main research interest is using algorithms to guide satellites for the purpose of studying coastal and open ocean environments. Please note that this webinar is recorded. Your videos and mics will be kept off for the duration of the presentation. And at the end, we will open up the floor to a question and answer period. Before I introduce our talk today, I would like to begin with an Indigenous affirmation. Of course, this webinar takes place online, but it is supported by the University of Ottawa, which is the city that I am all joining you from today, <clears throat> that I am joining you all from today, excuse me. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. So today's presentation uh, was inspired by a colleague of Emmanuel's who asked him if he could see poop from space. A fun story to start a great research project. Turns out that there was a plume that appeared to be escaping from Sable Island, uh, phytoplankton, island mass effect, climate change, and seals that could be seen. Uh, this research used satellite remote sensing of ocean color to characterize and study the plume just off of the coast of Nova Scotia. Researchers found that the plume was emitting chlorophyll concentrations and they were intensifying over the years. But this begged the question, why? The hard truth is it was climate change and a rapid increase in the gray seal breeding colony on Sable Island. So with that introduction, let's hear from Emmanuel for a bit more on understanding what this tells us about climate change, overpopulation and resulting disruptions in oceanic cycles. Over to you, Emmanuel, and thanks for joining us. Thank you uh, very much, Celeste. So um, I guess you can hear me. Uh, I'd like to also uh, acknowledge that here, so as uh, Celeste pointed out, I, uh, I am uh, calling from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, the entity territory of the Mi'kmaq uh, people. Uh, and today is my uh, pleasure to talk to you about this uh, uh, Sable Island and what's going on uh, with uh, Sable Island. So um, I'd like also to acknowledge my uh, co-author, so uh, Andrea Hilborn and uh, uh, Cornelia Denier. This seems a little bit funky, uh, things turning around. It's just we all, I think, uh, worked hard on that uh, project. And I felt it was not, I was not necessarily a primary uh, author, but I would like to acknowledge like everyone in an equal, uh, equal part. And uh, here it is. So we're all at, uh, working for fisheries and oceans at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. So what I'd like to show you is a nice map of uh, Nova Scotia here that you can recognize. But uh, actually, if I go back a little bit, that you see that little uh, island, not that little, because uh, you can see it from satellite pretty easily. And I'm going to zoom on it. And what I'd like to draw your attention in is that what uh, Celeste mentioned uh, uh, earlier is that we have a plume or something that's happening in the wake of Sebel Island and um, wondering what it is. So that should be the topic of, uh, of today's uh, presentation. So first I thought I would uh, introduce quickly uh, uh, some facts about Sebel Island. So, Sable Island is a bit an iconic place for Nova Scotia, so everyone knows it. You go in any uh, souvenir shops, you uh, you will see a picture of the famous horses of uh, Sable Island. So here it is, it's a very uh, strip of sand uh, in the middle of the ocean, about like 360 kilometers from Nova Scotia, so not uh, under influence of uh, the continents. And uh, so it's been designated a national park in uh, 2013. Well, you can uh, visit it if you have uh, an access, kind of a mean to access it. So it is made of uh, many of sand. It has a freshwater aquifer that runs so all the along all the length of the island, and it remains uh, the water remains on, uh, on the island through hydrostatic pressure. And this way, it can uh, support some uh, fauna and flora, including so um, a lot of grass, and uh, in particular those uh, maram grass but also there are other type of plants. Uh, you will also, um, uh, the weed like I, pu I put here on that uh, on the presentation, it's also um, 
uh, variable. And as much as the length is pretty constant, the winds can change with winds, erosion, it's, it's made of sand. And uh, in the end, what's known the most is also the horses of uh, Sebel Island. So you have a population of feral, feral um, horses. And also it's a breeding colony for gray seals. And it's actually it's the biggest, uh, largest uh, colony of uh, gray seals in the North, North Atlantic. We also do have birds. Uh, so just a little uh, ecosystem here that's surviving uh, in the middle of the ocean. So um, I show you here during my talk, I will try to answer the three question. Is a plume made of phytoplankton mainly? What is it made of? Uh, how does it change uh, in time and in space? And uh, why can we explain uh, what are the mechanisms that drive that, uh, that plume? So to answer this question, I will use uh, mainly uh, satellite uh, imagery. And this question that I'm going uh, to simplify uh, a little bit, it's, um, uh, the research question is kind of what, what is it made of, where, when, and why is it there? So that's through the, um, the talk, I will kind of go back sometime to uh, do a little summary uh, to follow up of why, uh, what questions we're answering here. So the main tool will be a satellite, so ocean color, so the satellite that uh, look at the Earth on, uh, in the visible spectrum. We call them like ocean color, or that's kind of the name, um, generic name for the products we derive. And we use some uh, data from uh, the Climate Change Initiative. So um, to go quickly over that initiative, they just, there's many satellites, they just, with different sometimes characteristics, different calibration on the, that initiative makes sure that all the satellites are intercalibrated. So we can have a long time series of consistent, uh, consistent data that are suitable for uh, um, uh, climate change uh, uh, studies. In our uh, case, we looked at, uh, we look at four kilometer resolution, that was enough for the, the area we're looking at. We don't need higher resolution. And we also look at different temporal resolution, a day. We looked at the season and four year period. Often we learn data depending on what question we want to answer. At the same time, uh, we wanted to, when we're going to look and I will present you results about Sable Island, we also uh, use two control boxes because just to make sure that what we see in Sable Island is not happening everywhere else, then it's in that way there would be nothing particular about, uh, about Sable Island. So often during uh, the presentation, I will talk mainly about those three, three boxes. So you have the Northeast box, uh, Sable Island SI on the Southwest, excuse me, Mouse here, Southwest uh, uh, box, which we call our control boxes. Uh, what type of data we use after? So, of course, we're going to use uh, one of the main products that's uh, derived from uh, ocean color. So the light is coming up to the satellite. And when we do uh, ratios of different uh, bandwidths, different colors, we can uh, have some information on the concentration of chlorophyll, which will going, going to be uh, an index or information of phytoplankton biomass. The more chlorophyll, the more phytoplankton biomass. But it's not only phytoplankton in the ocean, we have other things that we have also uh, to take care of because they do have a signal, a uh, visible signal, and can be uh, a contamination of that our chlorophyll. We want to make sure it's chlorophyll. So we also looked at uh, the absorption by sedum, so it means uh, uh, color dissolve organic matter. So uh, at the same time, on the right hand side, I was just showing some example of, uh, of uh, images. So you have your Sable Island here. And uh, for a given, uh, given date, here was a bit randomly taken in March 2001. We can see, uh, get information on, uh, on what's uh, happening around, in the water around the uh, Sebel Island. We use different algorithm. I'm not gonna go too much into detail about those, but just, just to note that uh, one use ratio of colors, this one is a bit more complicated and more advanced when we go directly to the light and inverse that light uh, to know what's in the water. When we do that, we also get information about what you call backscattering, particularly backscattering. So uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, ocean color or in general, uh, what's happening with photons in the atmosphere and the ocean. The photons, they get either absorbed or scattered. And what it measures, but when they absorb, they modify the signal and we don't see those photons, but a good uh, part of them are just uh, reflected back to the, to the um, 
to that monster on the satellite and it's how we can uh, mainly derive what you call backscattering. <laughs> that backscattering, it's provide information on the uh, abundance of, in general of particles in the water, that be mineral, uh, sand, uh, uh, sediments, but also biogenic, like uh, uh, phytoplankton cells or dead phytoplankton cells. And so again, so uh, we use that as uh, inversion algorithm. So the first uh, approach was um, to try to uh, see um, how, what was going on into that area without any a priori uh, delineation or try to be subjective. Because the idea was if I, if I say, okay, let's look at an area here that we would define like that and focus on it, just a hypothesis by assuming an area would just put, perhaps bias our, our approach. And we wanted to avoid that. So we went from very uh, crude uh, study, crude uh, areas, and we refined and we're uh, improving our knowledge. So very easy things like let's take those three box and let's see if that Sable Island box is different from the other one. So what you see uh, on the right hand side, um, I don't know if I didn't tell you earlier, but we get uh, about 20 years of data. So four days, every if we have daily data, we aggregate them into four days and then make an average and we can get what we would call a climatology or what is a mean seasonal uh, cycle. So here we have three, uh, so we look at chlorophyll concentration. What do we see here? We see uh, like in the, uh, what's going on in the ocean in the spring is like what's happening on land. You know, you see the leaves are coming on the trees is the same in the ocean, like phytoplankton with um, some different processes, but a lot of light, stratification of the water. you got a lot of uh, wind and storms, a lot of mixing in the winter when this stop in the spring, phytoplankton can, can kind of get stuck at the surface, gets a lot of light, a lot of nutrients, and it's blooming. And what we can see here, in the end, it's some information, different uh, magnitude of the bloom. So that start like March to, uh, to a late April. And the timing is we have a latitudinal timing, meaning the bloom is happening a bit earlier in the south, and which can be related to probably light av availability. So, no, nothing really conclusive here uh, that we found. And if I would be looking at the, what we call this uh, yellow substances, so absorb that absorption by DG, Zitratus, and Gelb stuff, I mean a bit, a bit the same, kind of a similar pattern, the same the gradient, different magnitude. Uh, in the end, for the backscattering, so which could be, uh, which is an, uh, information on uh, the load of particles in the, in the ocean, and notably for us, when we look, I mentioned earlier that Sable Island was a sandy, uh, a sandy island. So you, we could expect with currents and mixing a signal, signal from the sand, from the sand the particulates that are uh, carried into the water. So we do see a very different cycle uh, from uh, backscattering, which was pretty high, very low in the summer, probably when the currents are lowest, so not much suspension. And it picks up again uh, late uh, August, maybe midsummer. So again, uh, here's the main message: while the box, what you call that box, approach of different seasonal cycles, we don't see anything very special for uh, for Sable Island. And one of the main issues, like when we smooth the signal, when you smooth the signal in a, a, a large area, we kind of lose, lose uh, some of these uh, uh, fine scale uh, uh, features. So again, within the same spirit of not defining, uh, not having an app, uh, not knowing, or uh, I would say biasing our approach to make to towards what we want to find, we decided to look at take small boxes and actually took boxes all around Sable Island and we looked at the signal within the smaller boxes. Uh, I'm not showing result for the right hand side because there's nothing very uh, extraordinary to see. Follow the same cycles and those bigger boxes. But when we look here and, those, uh, and it's color coded to the smaller box, we can see, especially like in the southwest of uh, Sable Island, that the peak of chlorophyll is first arriving much earlier, uh, starting to increase much earlier uh, than uh, in those bigger box, even starting sometime like in the late, uh, in the winter, and peaking much higher. 
And then looking at it so far, when I was uh, actually mentioning is uh, around uh, October, November, when uh, you get our fall bloom uh, here. Uh, it's just a feature that's known as a squish and shelf. We can see that around Sable Island, the small boxes, uh, the increase in chlorophyll is much more dramatic than you could see in the fall bloom. And you're, what we'll see also is when the fall bloom is, uh, is decreasing. Uh, that seems that it's, um, it's sustained here uh, of uh, several uh, islands. So first, what we do now, we kind of demonstrated that we do have a different cycle uh, of chlorophyll in magnitude and in timing uh, around on the southward uh, of Sable Island. And actually, what it's called, it's, so I, I didn't mention here, we I put some arrows about the currents and what's happening, It's and it's a well-known effect that's been documented uh, before it's mass uh, island effect. So the current goes this way from northeast to southwest, go around the island. At the back of the island, you get some turbulence, you have some resuspension, probably nutrients, and that generate uh, enhanced uh, production in the ocean. But often it was demonstrated in oligotrophic, like often it's, happen it's happening in tropical islands. It's not been shown much on in temperate latitude on shelves like uh, of, uh, of Nova Scotia. Uh, just to keep on a little bit on the same story with our two other parameters, what we can see again is sedum, uh, so the absorption is higher in the, in the winter, uh, much higher than our uh, control boxes. Not that, it's not that uh, obvious in, at the beginning of the fall. And again, for the uh, backscattering, so that indication of particulate load, we can see very, very strong signal, very close. Uh, to the, to the island. So from that more targeted um, approach, targeted uh, study in smaller boxes, we kind of show that uh, we see that crophilia and sedum, so those two products remain correlated, especially in winter, they start to pick up together. And uh, backscattering has a very, very different uh, seasonal cycle than those two other properties. So how we, so that first analysis, showed us that, okay, there's something happening, island mass effect, there is uh, um, uh, some enhance of chlorophyll concentration, more phytoplankton uh, increasing into the ocean. I didn't mention phytoplankton, I mean, it's like grass in the, uh, on land, pretty much on a bush, or maybe some of the trees was the biggest uh, phytoplankton. So it really sustains the food web. So we, or it's really of interest when you see enhanced uh, chlorophyll concentrations at spring bloom, for example, it's a very important event uh, for, the, for the ocean. So in the end, we were, uh, we could explain to that uh, some of the uh, chlorophyll with a mass island effect, but you want to better characterization of its spatial temporal uh, variation. So we use uh, our, we took our time series and we fed it in a kind of uh, advanced, um, uh, advanced statistical approach, which is called like self-organizing map, kind of a fancy name for this type of a principal component analysis. When you take all your images in your time series and uh, you reorganize them in a matrix and you're going to choose a number of uh, patterns that you need kind of uh, to decide how many patterns you want to, uh, to uh, identify and I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but in our case, it was nine. We did some sensitivity tests on every single uh, colon is going to be assigned and tested against those patterns. When it belongs to a pattern, the pattern is being recomputed, uh, like a type of a distance, a mean, that will account for that new images and some iteration, 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 until the entire distance, uh, the quadratic distance of the system is minimal. It's kind of, you can see, uh, like just distributing things around computing distances between single images and the average, and you change, change, change all those uh, possibilities and, until you find the lowest uh, average uh, possibility. And when you do that, in the end, you're gonna get nine patterns, which I'm going to show you right now. So uh, those patterns, a lot of information on, uh, on that slide, and I'm gonna get a bit of time to explain it. So first, you see those, uh, I guess they are one, two, three, four, six uh, hexagon. Uh, we have like those nine hexagon where our nine uh, patterns. 
And we can, uh, we can also have the memberships uh, uh, that was assigned to each image to what pattern. So if I look, for example, let's say look at the number one, so that patterns, we can see that it, ha it appears uh, in our time series uh, almost 14% of the time. On what image was assigned to the temporal, uh, sorry, frequency of this image when they were assigned to that pattern? So it was mainly, you can see in, uh, in uh, winter and, uh, and uh, winter in general, uh, late fall and uh, early spring. So you can go, so use two things we can do. When are those patterns appearing in time? Uh, most of the time. And this is what I have reproduced here in this little uh, circle. So if you go now in time, we can see that, let's start with January. We can see in January to February, that pattern here with a plume, actually it's what we're interested in. It's happening mainly from uh, December all the way to uh, uh, mid-February. Then here's that pattern when you see very a lot of yellow, a lot of profile. Here we just hit the spring bloom here in March. And you can move like that with time. And as uh, um, we going towards the blue, less chlorophyll concentration, May, June, July, right in the summer. The nutrients have been depleted in the ocean. There's a lot of stratification. Phytoplankton becomes kind of dormant. And that cycle goes again, uh, move to into September, October, and here we start to reach that, uh, that fall bloom. So what we are really interested in, in our case, and I just zoom on it, that pattern number five that I just uh, mentioned. When you can see that when everyone is more in the very the blue or very light green, you do have a strong signal of chlorophyll here. Uh, and it's up, yeah, okay. So what I was seeing just happened was nothing much uh, happening around. And here we just put a little uh, contour at the one milligram per cubic meter to see what's the kind of set the threshold for high biomass. So, um, uh, we kind of start to explain what is it, where and when uh, it happens. And here, so to summary, uh, just a bit of a summary. So I just mentioned that uh, Sable, um, uh, the high phytoplankton uh, biomass that's happened leeward, so responsible for the ice, um, island mass effect, and it's kind of consistent with currents. So here we went onto, onto a, a NOAA website look at the, so the uh, simulations and we looked at the current. So we can see it's in agreement, for example, in March, which you have a lot of currents. Uh, lit here, uh, some quite some currents still on the, uh, it's, it's called, it's, it's called a Sable uh, Shoal here, Sable Shoal Banks. And when you contrast that to the summer with much less currents, and it's also an explanation why there is less chlorophyll concentration leeward of uh, Sable Island. And then, because we do have a 20 year uh, time series, it's kind of interesting to see if that has that, uh, is that uh, uh, profit consumption have been changed. Not only is, we know already it's changing with season as it's changed over the last 20 years. So I'm going to go back a, a bit to bit some a bit of context. So we still have our Northeast uh, box, our Southwest box. We are always interested in these two boxes because if what we see in these boxes, is similar to what happens on the uh, around Sable Island. There's really nothing's happening. But so here, so we looked for season, uh, our three properties. I'm kind of highlighting the results here to see where we would see a positive trends. Uh, rough quickly, positive, positive and significant trend in the winter for chlorophyll. We can see also that the yellow substances are also increasing in, uh, in the winter as well also in the summer, while the backscattering is kind of decreasing. So here, I'm not gonna, we not gonna go too much into why those things happening and the open ocean, uh, that would be another, another topic, but actually I'm going to focus mainly on the winter because in the winter we see uh, something that's very interesting is I just mentioned that we can see from about 1998 all the way to 2016, I think where we stopped that, uh, the study. We can see that uh, the sedum increased a lot on our Northeast box on the Sebel Island, about almost at the same uh, rate, but slower on uh, that Southwest box. But really what I would like to uh, bring your attention is that number is 0.028, which shows that uh, around Sebel Island in winter, Chlorophyll concentration, so phytoplankton biomass has been increasing twice as fast as our control boxes. So that's kind of uh, 
that's what uh, trigger our interest and say what's going on here and decide to uh, to pursue a little bit a little bit a little bit more so i'm stopping again for a little summary so make sure i'm not getting lost and hopefully you can also uh, follow me so it might be a little bit repetitive but what we've seen so far we do have high phytoplankton by phytoplankton biomass uh, of several island Interestingly, that biomass uh, increases in winter twice as fast as any other places on the Scotian shelf. And uh, it seems so the conclusion from that finding that second bullet that climate forcing cannot alone explain uh, that increase of, um, of biomass. Not only there's an increase of biomass, but you would also um, see that the plume extent are also increased quite a lot. So here, what we've been doing again, it's uh, we've been lumping our data I mentioned for, we look at four days data at the beginning to get the seasonal cycle, then we went for um, a seasonal when we look at trends. Here for the last part of the study, uh, we went, we lumped even more of our data into four periods. We did that to avoid or to, lead, uh, to reduce effect of missing data due to clouds or other, or mainly clouds actually. So what I see here uh, to go uh, uh, quickly, and I'm repeating myself is that, so in the first 99 to 2003, see we already had that plume, but really if you compare it to the period four, it's had exploded, if I, I may say. Um, so why, why is that happened? So it's here when I can, could that be the seals actually? So Sable Island, so this is some picture of uh, Sable Island uh, from uh, early December to uh, late uh, February. This is a breeding season. Uh, so uh, couples uh, come here, see that a uh, baby seal. I like that picture sent by my colleague by Nell, actually when you can see kind of the parents are bickering at the back when they, the kids are just kind of hanging at uh, the front there. Uh, see a lot of seals. So there's a moratorium on the seals uh, culling uh, back in the mid 70s. And uh, since the uh, population of seals have increased on the Eastern board of Canada, and a uh, lot of them are going to Sable Island, uh, around 10,000 uh, in a, uh, it's a basis, ba basic population right now, all year long on, uh, on Sable Island. And actually I've just better to so with uh, with numbers here when I was mentioning that when uh, hunting uh, of seals has stopped, you can see that there is an increase. So here's a uh, pup, so the baby seals from about, uh, there was around a few thousand now to almost, uh, I think they were reaching like 86,000 seals that are being born every year on uh, Sable Island. So quite, quite a lot. And we can see that kind of a linear, linear increase which can translate in terms of uh, total seal number. And here I just put the number starting at the satellite, uh, our satellite time series. And you had about an increase of five to 7% of uh, a year of seals on Sable Island. So during the breeding season, so that's important, I keep reminding those numbers are during the breeding season. So you go from about 100,000 seals in the late 90s, early 2000, now we reach almost like 300,000 seals on Sable Island. I don't know if you remember the maps, it's like it's about 34 square kilometer. So pretty small. And I think it's something like uh, 1,000 seals or 10,000 seals per 10,000 seals per square kilometer. So it's quite a high uh, density. So now we would go from uh, next step would be from seal to chlorophyll concentration. So fertilization of the ocean by uh, mammals uh, is not something new. It's, uh, it's happened either by uh, different processes and by any kind of mammals and birds actually. So whales, dolphins, uh, I, I kind of whales are the most significant one because they're big. So they're gonna fertilize when they're letting themselves, uh, relieving themselves in the oceans, a lot of amount of nutrients. They also, um, uh, do fertilize the ocean through a mixing, uh, going up and down, up and down, can bring, as it's been demonstrated, that they can bring uh, food all the way to the surface. And uh, other, so the deposition process from this animal can be runoff from land, as you can imagine. It can, um, uh, it's raining and uh, whatever is uh, dropped is gonna go to the ocean. Also atmospheric deposition has been demonstrated and I mentioned that uh, mixing. So there are some work that has been done in the Gulf of Maine. So Gulf of Maine is a Southern Nova Scotia. Uh, 
and uh, so the northeast of the um, of the US, where Roman and McCarthy in 2010 they published that paper. They really did an extensive study to look at how much uh, net, um, uh, nitrate or so nitrogen was uh, released in the ocean. Uh, phytoplankton, what do they need to grow? They need the main uh, nutrients is uh, nitrogen. They also need, they also need a silicate and phosphate, but really the base, the really main one is uh, nitrates. Uh, and that's why I think uh, Roman and McCarthy focus on this one. So in uh, the Gulf of Maine, it's very known, uh, like a lot of whales are going in the uh, summer. It's a feeding, uh, big uh, feeding uh, grounds. So you can see that here when I look at the number, so how much kilograms they excrete a day, you get the population and you can get some fluxes. And here I'm just pointing out to the last boxes. Uh, you can see the um, send me email or if you are interested by the reference. But we, the number we were finding interesting, it's not many uh, big population, 1,700 seals of gray seals, the one we're interested in. But what's the number I was interested in that they measured that they would be uh, excreting 220 grams of nitrogen every day. So, uh, how do we go from seal to chlorophyll? So we didn't do a very fancy uh, science for a lot of assumption and uh, logic. So from uh, Maca, uh, McCarthy, uh, we see that we are having 220 grams of uh, uh, nitrogen. We know the molecular weight, so we can uh, transform those grams per day in uh, moles uh, of uh, nit uh, nitro nitrogen three per day. And then we know from uh, other studies that with uh, pretty much one, um, with one mole of uh, nitrogen, you can sustain about 1.59, uh, uh, sorry, that was a millimole, sorry, 1.59 milligram of chlorophyll. So very simple, uh, just kind of a multiplicative model. And now we can, so we know how much one seal per day can sustain chlorophyll concentration. And then we did a little bit of a model, like a little equation here that explains uh, our knowledge of seeds. So it's, again, nothing fancy. Uh, what we see, uh, we know that these days the seals are just starting to arrive at uh, uh, late November, early December. They're going to come in a, almost, we assume, in a linear manner and they're going to reach the peak of the breeding season, and then they leave very quickly, um, uh, very quickly the, uh, the, um, the island. And then, only, and then they just go all over from the Gulf of St. Lawrence all the way to the Gulf of Maine. They're really, really uh, after the summer grounds, are pretty, pretty wide. So just that equation is just simulating the population of seals on the... Um, on uh, Sable Island, and we can do, we have the number, so we average for uh, uh, beans of four years, population of seals, so we can see uh, early in the, uh, the P1, that will refer to the P1 uh, period, early in the year when they were in the 100,000, and uh, what we did here, we computed the chlorophyll concentrations that could be sustained, so in, uh, in ton, during the breeding season by seal, and we're up to 139, 188. You can see that the um, uh, sustained amount of chlorophyll, uh, uh, chlorophyll A in tons uh, increased quite a lot. And we're up to that later, so lately, 2014 to 2018. So half of the uh, chlorophyll concentration, but half that could be uh, sustained by uh, seals, half of it happened during the three months during the breeding season. So now we do have uh, information on that little theoretical model and how do this value compare to satellite estimates? So to derive chlorophyll, um, uh, chlorophyll uh, contents, like tons of chlorophyll, it's a little bit even more simpler than our little seal model. The satellite is a chlorophyll A in, uh, in milligram per cubic meter. We know the surface area of our plume in square meter, so we multiply. So we, we can remove the, uh, the uh, two dimension and the third dimension to know, uh, we assume that uh, 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 profile of chlorophyll, so on the water colon was because in the winter there's a lot of mixing. We can assume that it is a constant uh, as we can uh, see here that the mixed layer of depth. So um, I mentioned winter. So uh, the ocean is very mixed. So what we call the mixed layer of depth kind of the uh, how many? So simply, it's where 
lot of turbulence here. The wind is blowing, it's making a lot of turbulence, and that turbulence can go all the way to 50, 60 meters. So it's mixing the water. As soon as we hit April, you can see those who have way less storm when you have that heating, uh, heating and stratification of the surface where you would see way less, uh, less phytoplankton and it's kind of stuck at the surface where it cannot get uh, nutrients from the bottom anymore. So the point I wanted to make here is uh, during our era of interest, it's during a period of uh, strong mixing and then it would be nutrients and the chlorophyll concentration, the biomass is pretty much homogeneous all over the, um, the water column. Here I show you an example of, uh, it's a station that we sample every two weeks all year long, or we try depending again on weather. And so it's, it's really, when I look at the climatology, those are very reliable data that are not located uh, that far from, uh, from a Sable Island. And so we can get the chlorophyll in tons as well. So now we can compare. We have one model on one side, satellite that on the other side. Here I'm going to show you quickly. So uh, we go back to our period one. So when we would see uh, into our uh, uh, sum into our area of interest, that sum five, and we can see it's very well our spring bloom and then the summers nothing's happening. And when you look at the period four, so like those are almost like 15 years later, and we can make a difference on these two, we can see that we have do now we start to have an excess of chlorophyll concentration, all the order of almost, uh, see on the green, label almost uh, 150 tons excess of chlorophyll in February, a time of the year we should, it should not, uh, should not, it doesn't happen anywhere else. And here, again, I put just as a little reminder, the phenology of phytoplankton on the Sable Island. So of course it agrees with the two periods, the timing is the same, but what we see now and more recent year, we have that pulse of uh, food into the ocean, uh, almost 234 tons. So what we did here, uh, another bit of a complicated slide, is to try to tease apart, as I mentioned, climate change, seas, what's going on. So the satellite is those black dots. So what I've shown you, so we have seen a very strong from the period P1, P2, and to P4, strong increase. Um, if we look uh, at uh, just what would have been the seal fertilization, so it's starting, uh, we mentioned something, um, around, uh, okay, I don't get mixed up in my number, yeah, 130 tons that we showed earlier and how it's been increasing, I, it's here. Sorry, I was more looking at the wrong things, uh, open circle, uh, increased by uh, seals, so from 130 to almost 200 uh, tons. And assuming uh, the, to look at the air effect of climate forcing, I took the rate of increase of crowd field concentration in our control box and I projected here. So now if we add uh, climate change and the seals, we would have that blue uh, line uh, starting at the same uh, point. So we still, uh, of course, we have some disagreement with the satellites. There's a lot of other uncertainties, there's some advection, there's other explanation, but at least we can now simulate the increase. And what we can do that's over those uh, uh, last 20 years, we could say it's still cut into part of um, five years, 50% of the increase would, uh, would be due to uh, climate forcing, but also 30% of increase in chlorophyll concentration is due by seal fertilization of the ocean. So to conclude, uh, so we using satellite again, that was funny in the abstract that I put, but it's really what happened. So Nell, that's one of the co-author, I know her as well, uh, with colleagues, it's a, uh, probably July before the pandemic, everyone is at the lab. We get out four o'clock and she looks at me and I say, hey, Manuel, like, can we see poop from the ocean? And really it's, uh, it's brown when you think about it. So I say, of course, they like, should have a, a spectral signature, but it's interesting how we push that uh, kind of a joke a little bit further and using a fully um, a satellite, uh, satellite data, we were able to demonstrate a, a few a few things. So the plume, we oui, there's a plume may, may, uh, mainly of uh, chlorophyll concentration. Uh, that plume uh, is uh, is um, kind of dynamic. It explains the mass island, mass, mass islands effect. You know the currents uh, within the uh, leeward of the islands, and there's two uh, two factors that were explaining this increase. One is uh, uh, global warming. 
that uh, this we see an increase in chlorophyll concentration on the Scotian shelf, but much faster on a Sable Island. It's also explained by that explosion in a, in a seal population. Uh, that was uh, what next? Because in India, there was a kind of very theoretical uh, uh, study. As we speak, actually, there's our ship, or not our ship, is broken. So we borrowed one, borrowed one from the US, but it's right there, like off in the Gulf of Maine. And I suppose when he's going to come back, he's going to so Sable Island is here. It's supposed to go sample around and try to have evidence, like ground truthing evidence that the, um, that uh, the, there is something with, that would be due to the seals. And unfortunately, I got an email today. I was mentioning we get uh, our, we brought a ship and the people are not very used to the way we work on the, our sampling is going much slower than usual. So it's looked like we're gonna have to uh, uh, drop on those, uh, on those extra red uh, uh, stations so we can go back on time. Actually, it's kind of interesting. So when you see those uh, stations that we do, we do that twice a year, uh, spring and fall is part of our monitoring program at uh, Fisheries and Oceans. I try to also uh, convince my colleagues to have a helicopter so because first I want to go to Sable Island very badly. I think it's very beautiful and uh, uh, it's very expensive, so that hasn't happened yet, but we're going to try to grant truth a little bit what we've been uh, seeing from a satellite. And this is it. So here are those uh, horses from uh, Sable Island. And thank you very much for following the talk. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, feel free to ask them to me. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for that great presentation. Let's take some questions from the audience. Oh, hi, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I never know uh, that uh, seals have such a such a huge impact on the chlorophyll concentration. Uh, I, I have a few questions actually, but the first one is uh, on the image that we see now. Are they like native species of the island, the, the, the horses? Or um, um, no, they're not native species. They've been there for a few hundred of years. What happened, it's, it's a long time ago, ships used to have horses, you know, when they were coming from Europe to Canada and that island is, um, uh, there's no lighthouse, nothing on it. And there's, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, ship wrecks. I think more than 30 or 40. And so the horses would have escaped from those, uh, uh, wrecks when they, they were happening and just came on uh, uh, on the island. From what I understand, so they've been cut. They really, it's a, it's a, they have their own species now because they've been isolated from other horses for so long that they are naturally here. So it's how uh, how it happens. Yeah, oh, wow, that's that's very cool. Uh, could you go back to the the to the sampling page with the, the map? Oh yeah, exactly. That's it. What, what is C CTD? Uh, CTD, uh, so that's, so I took that slide from my colleague who's a CTD, is a conductivity, temperature and density, how you make our profile. So we do, actually we do a lot of measurements when you go on those, on those cruises. We do, so the oceanographic cruises, we don't do fish survey, but we measure everything from uh, currents and salinity and temperatures, the basics all the way to phytoplankton and zooplankton. So we do prof so every of we stop at every of those dots you see there and it can, uh, we can uh, we deploy our CTD and there's bottles and then 24 bottles of uh, uh, 12 liters each and uh, we profile temperature salinity and then every so often we stop and take uh, water samples. So I think all of together like out of the thing we're probably gonna get 2000 uh, samples, uh, I mean, uh, 2,000 depths are going to be sampled. It's quite remarkable. I think uh, it's also interesting just oh, I promote my uh, my department of the work we do, but um, it's a lot of, lot of, lot of data. It's very impressive what is collected on those cruises. It's thousands of thousands of uh, data points. And you know, you look because I provide you with profit concentration, but we do measure way more than that. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. I hope one day um, 
I can get on one of your cruises and just observe what you what, what you guys do. That'll be. Uh, you're more than welcome, but I'm telling you right now, you're not gonna be observing. You will be doing it. Like it's expensive as well. So mm. if you go on the ship, you're working like everyone else. <laughs> it's only because you also deploy mooring uh, for physical oceanographers or other things. So those big like cables that can be four kilometers long with ton of instruments. And it was gonna take two days to deploy those things, but we go, we're gone for two weeks to a month and everyone is chips in. Uh, so it's possible. It's mm -hmm. very possible yeah. you get trained and then you can come uh, come at sea. <laughs> That'll be wonderful. Okay, my last question. Uh, sorry, guys. It's uh, where do the seals go after breeding? I, I, I didn't, uh, I missed that. Uh, they go, I don't know if I have a, yeah, uh, I don't have another, I don't have another, um, Things, but they go. Let's go back and um, wait here. I'm gonna go back into the uh, sharing on this here. I'm gonna go maybe to the first slide. That would be easier because they go all over the place. They go so they here. You have like three hundred thousand seals, and then ten thousand is gonna say stay there. But they all going all over to the Gulf of Saint Lawrence up there, all the way to the Gulf of Maine. But any place when you walk these hikes around the Nova Scotia. The colonies they have their favorite grants, and they just go. You're gonna find colonies here and there. Some hang around here a lot in the water. They sleep. They sleep at the. They don't need to go to land actually. They sleep at the bottom of the ocean, and the, uh, it's very interesting. I learned a lot during that work. It's uh, some people are wondering what they were doing. So they have uh, tags on them, and they go and they stay at the bottom, and suddenly they come back later. But no one knew really what they were doing. But um, a colleague of mine put cameras recently and they're sleeping. They're literally sleeping at the bottom of the ocean. They, and with the current, you can see them like sometimes they roll and they sleep for half an hour and then come back to the surface. So they can live in the, in the ocean, but when they breathe, they need a uh, hard soil for the pups. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, thank you for your uh, presentation and your answers. Thank you. Can I ask a question too? Hi, yeah. Emmanuel. Hi. Uh, yeah, like your last uh, slide uh, with the horses, I wonder if you could uh, do similar study about eutrophication of the of the coastal waters uh, related to the horse population of the Sable Island. But it's not actually my question. That, that my question is: uh, uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, your uh, um, reflectance measurements or the measure are were contaminated by the bottom reflection, and. Um, now I'm referring actually to your last article, your publication about uh, uh, study on uh, uh, bottom uh, vegetation using uh, different satellite data. But did you, in your in this study which you have presented, did you take into account uh, using the sensors uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, in your presentation for the bottom reflectance? Um, two things. First, uh, to answer your first comment, actually, studies have been made about uh, 30, uh, bits of horses that do also have an impact on the island, but it's not that many. Uh, I think they never more, maybe 100, 200, so it's very small compared to the seas and their populations. They vary quite a lot. I think they can be, if there's harsh winters or things like that, you can have less than 50 horses. Uh, second, uh, Two things, uh, and uh, thank you for your question because I forgot to mention, if I go back here, um, uh, in some of the study after when I saw those big, uh, we removed seas at Red Square, we kind of remove the very uh, shallow waters to not be impacted by the bottom. Uh, two things, when we, the paper you're mentioning, uh, we, uh, we go and we look for the clearest water possible. and I've, to see the bottom. So the clearer the water, the deeper you go. And when the paper you mentioned, you probably can uh, map vegetation all the way to 10 meters deep, which is already, uh, for Nova Scotia, it's quite a lot. In the tropics, they probably can go to like 20, 30 when the water is so clear. Uh, we didn't use, we, the, so the, after you straight off with satellite, when we do um, uh, bottom uh, classification, as you mentioned, uh, we need a high resolution. Uh, we work with satellites, so commercial satellite at two meters or free uh, satellite at 10 meter resolution. But the uh, trade off with the satellite at very high resolution, they don't come often over the same spot. Maybe by now with Sentinel, it would be every five days. Once so you, you can combine, sorry, if you, if you combine Sentinel 2 with, the, with uh, Landsat 8 and 9, um, you can. Yeah, we get could, the... but 
Yep, we could. We've we've looked into it uh, for so, and then you have cloud cover, and yeah, there's a turbidity in the water, and we need to account for the tide to have very specific uh, needs. When we look at the study, so and then the study where I'm looking at uh, here, you know, it's pretty big. Like we go like all the way like 50 kilometers, so maybe that resolution is not uh, high resolution that needed for the study here. And uh, when I look at the um, uh, globe colors, not the globe colors, uh, ocean color, like CCI data sets, they merge satellite to have one image pretty much every day. Hmm. Um, but what you, I think we looked into, we do have Sentinel-2 images, but we were not able to, not, not enough images to be able to do a, a study as robust as this one. The next step, I was I was looking actually uh, that image here. Is this is a Sentinel two images, and you can see a beautiful like we can see some of those meander. Uh, we have less bands uh, to to derive our products, so they're not maybe they might they might be not as accurate. But also, you know, in terms of uh, so the two limitation would be to go quick, uh, revisit. Is not the best, and also when you want to look at the big areas, uh, it's very hard to handle all those data. Like, see, with four kilometers, if you so one pixel with that big study we did for the Scotian shelf, imagine 10 meters. So, you need uh, 100, uh, it's going to be 400 by 400. So, if we go from one pixel to uh, 160,000 pixels. So, in terms of memory and managing uh, those things it would be uh, pretty hard to run, I say, one pixel, 160,000 pixels. Now look on the cushion shelf, you probably have like, I didn't count them, but probably like in the thousands of pixels. So we would go quickly into hundreds of millions of pixels and uh, we don't have the computing resources to deal with that. Actually, you answered my question, which was about a combination of, uh, of different uh, satellite missions. Uh, I, maybe I missed it. Uh, which satellite was using for you study was it modis okay. or yes yeah, so it's um yeah you, i was a pretty brief on that so uh the ocean so that's ocean color climate change initiative is sponsored by uh for supported by the european space agency so they took sea waves modis deers uh, marys and also Olchi. so we have six seven satellites and what they make sure is that uh satellites uh, agree to each other because if you yeah. take two satellites, well, probably yeah. you know it sounds like you work with satellites, but if you take a MODIS and a VIRS, when they overlap in a given hour, they're not going to give you the same answer. So they realign all the satellites together and they, uh, they calibrate them and uh, do some quality control on the data. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Maybe one one last question. You mentioned just mentioned calibration of the of the data by sea truth or ground truth. How frequently? I mean, uh, especially for the chlorophyll. Um, how frequently you could calibrate your imagery using the the, the in situ measurements? Uh, every year. <laughs> so oh, these two things, you know. Okay. <laughs> the satellites, the agencies do their own work, but you know they they go to generic algorithm, and those algorithms they're gonna work. Yeah pretty well everywhere, but we retune them. So you see, I show you this data, like the last cruise, we get them back and we reassess our, we constantly uh, uh, testing the algorithm and providing errors because those uh, satellite, like here, I should just uh, a given studies a bit like fun on the side, but we do provide a lot of support for uh, futures and oceans Thank for, you. to deliver our mandate. And you're welcome, you. thanks. Emmanuel, can I ask a question? Only if it's an easy one. <laughs> you mentioned in one of your last slides that there are uh, conservation and fisheries management Im implications of the work. Yeah, yeah. It just, I, I don't know what they are. Could you just sort of briefly outline what you think they might be? Uh, yes, so uh, I'm going to go from very wide to less wide. So. Canada has uh, committed to uh, have 30% of uh, marine protected areas of its own water by 2030, 25% by 2025. So some of the work that we do, so here in science, and we provided advice to our 
uh, colleagues, so I don't want to go into many ways. There are many branches. I'm in the science branch. There's a branch called Ocean Management. That's the one who does policy and look at the borders for uh, for uh, uh, for those areas, marine protected areas. Before you being assigned as a marine protected area, you need to first become an EPSA, ecologically and biologically uh, significant area. And actually, uh, this area here is already, so if you would look at the, at the uh, Scotian shelf, all the scientists meet that do uh, everything uh, from the water column to the bottom, mammal, everything. And we draw more or less sometimes by hand borders. So on, in Nova Scotia, on the Scotian shelf, we probably have like 30 EPSAs. Uh, and then they need to decide which one would be uh, an MPA. So here, you see that line goes uh, here. You see here we go the gully lines because here there's an MPA, for example. We added there's a uh, marine protected area here. So here my uh, ID is uh, my ID was here to uh, I, I mean also Parks Canada. This is a national park. That area here is an EPSA. So the idea would be to uh, do more work around there and maybe suggested to be uh, classified as a marine protected areas. So it's how we can, so we're constantly providing that scientific data to uh, ocean management to uh, look first, help designing new MPAs, also to look at the star, how our MPAs are, how are they doing? How are the things changing as affected by climate change? And, one of the things it's a more, you know, you used to put like straight line on the map that's gonna stay there forever. But I think slowly is realizing that, you know, the ocean is very dynamic and maybe those things should be adapted, but uh, it's where satellite can become handy. Thanks, that was, that was great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emmanuel, one more time for that fantastic presentation. You obviously raised a lot of questions, so I'm sure everyone, including myself, enjoyed having you here today. Um, it is now 12.59, so we'll end this session. Um, Emmanuel, if you're comfortable with it, you can share your email, and if anyone has any further questions, they can contact you that way. Um, you'd have yeah, to of course, yeah. Uh, my email, first name, last name at DFO, but... Um... DFO on some stuff, but ask Anders. <laughs> we could provide it to you or Yulun as well. Like we just we do um, work together a bit, quite a bit. Well, and I go. thank you for having me here. That was a pleasure to uh, talk uh, uh, to uh, to that audience. Fantastic. Thanks again. So there you go, guys. Everyone, uh, Anders is your middleman. Um, thank you for spending your afternoon with us. And you can keep an eye on the Fleet Langua webpage and your inbox for our next event. Until then, have a fantastic rest of the day, everyone. <laughs>